What up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Jesse Warden here. Today we're going to talk about enums as compared to discriminated unions in TypeScript. Jesse Warden. And by the end of this video, you'll understand why discriminated unions are better than enums and probably why you should be using discriminated unions better and how they can help make your code safer. When we talk about discriminated unions, what we're really talking about is the ability to model data. When we model data, dynamic languages let you model anything. If you're using TypeScript, you have a plethora of typed options available to you on how you model the world. And it doesn't matter if you're a functional programmer or an object-oriented programmer, but you're going to look at those types, whether you're using type or interface, and find a way to model your problem domain, whether you're using test-driven development or not, and use those types to ensure that you've modeled it correctly, it guarantees the situations you want. You model impossible situations, you make them impossible. What we mean by atomics is something that is referring to this, referring to that. It is a single value that refers to something. So something like name equals drape me. That's a name. That's the variable name that equals me. So the, the property value, right? That's what we mean by atomics. It's a single variable that refers to a single value. We then have things such as that represent and. So using the language of this or that, we can identify distinct objects or nouns. When we have ands, we can make compound things we can, or products. We can bring things together. So, for example, a dog would have both a name of Albus and an age. So, single value, single variable, but using the word and, we can bring that data together. So this is how we model the real-world objects. We have a single name that refers to that. We have a dog, which is a record or an object that has ands. It has a name and an age. What we're missing is or. Our or would be something like a breed. It's either, and when I say either, either or, right? It's a breed of, it could be a lab, it could be a Sheltie, or it could be a Husky, right? And that's what we mean by or. So it's one of these sets. So the union itself is the breed. The breed is one of these values. When you reference the breed, though, on the dog, it's going to be one of those values. So it can never be both a lab and a husky at the same time. It can only be one. Now, you can say that it's of this group, this breed, and of type breed, and it has one of these things. But you're always going to use the word or to say it's, it's a lab or a sheltie or a husky. right? It's always going to be one of those values. The, the things that we often do with types is we are narrowing our domain. We're making it easier for us to guarantee that our code works and the happy path that we've divided, and sometimes the unhappy path. The or helps you say, like, these are the only three types of breeds that I can possibly be, and you have to pick one, right? Things like strings can be anything. Numbers can be anything from negative infinity to infinity and nan, right? Ors really help you narrow it down to just those three things, very similar to enums. Before any of this existed, right, before any of this existed, we didn't have that, whether it was in JavaScript or ActionScript, we didn't have any of those types. What we would do is we would use some kind of constant at the top and we'd capitalize it. We would say like lab equals a zero. And then we would say husky equals a one and then Sheltie equals a two. And the reason we did that is we wanted distinct values. So if we were testing things like if dog breed equals husky, right, then you could compare it to other things like husky does not equal lab, right? And because zero and one don't equal each other, it was a way to get really primitive basic of constants. Well, then the object oriented programmers came in and said, hey, why don't you use something like DTO or data transfer objects? They're basically objects that have data. So there's no behavior, no methods attached to it. And we were like, oh, that's a novel concept. So suddenly you could start grouping these things into a distinct object. So we'd have lab and Sheltie and husky and again we're capitalizing to denote like yo this is a constant it's never going to change it was neat because you could do the same thing like if dog breed equals breed dot lab and so it was a way to group these constants and areas instead of just magic variables floating ever then we got into the object oriented world where the java developers and the c sharp developers said all right javascript really needs classes we got to have really good oop so you would say something like breed Lab equals zero, Sheltie equals one, Husky equals two, constructor, and it's a singleton, so you can't instantiate it. Throw a new error, because oop is silly, you cannot 
instantiate this class, you use get inst instead, get inst or whatever, and you would instantiate this class and blah, 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 do all the singleton details, right? This is why oop drives me crazy nowadays. And then you would say if dog.breed equals breed.lab. I'm sorry, get instance. Right, there we go. Now we're true oop. And the reason this is important is that as type languages came about, they can enforce things that were instances on these particular properties. And you can guarantee that you only had one. So it's a step ahead of the variables because you have it grouped an object. The object was cool, but you could make multiple copies of those objects and different. The singleton allowed us to have at least a better approach to having a single object, one in the code base with some kind of enforcement, right? So it helped guarantee that when we have these three breeds, we really mean these three. There's no way to like dynamically change the object at runtime or copy it through destruction or some immutable <laughs> data way. There was no way to screw it up, right? We made it really hard to screw up, really worked hard to narrow those types into only these three things. So here we get into the crux of the problem though. Using these enums was never enforced very well. And the, the issue with that is if you were trying to guarantee that you only hit the three allowed and you didn't forget them. So let me show you an example. If you do a switch statement on the dog.breed, you could do a case statement and say, lab, do some stuff, and then case, shelty, do some stuff. The issue is that you forgot Husky. And so that's a common problem in enums is that either the code isn't co-located so you don't remember it in your head, or you have to open the file on a separate monitor, or you just forget for whatever reason because there's nobody helping you, there's no compiler. And so you forget Husky. So in the case that some dog has a breed of Husky, your code does something weird, does something not weird, doesn't do some operation it's supposed to do, or throws in a runtime exception. You're like, oh, because I forgot that particular part of the enum. The other issue is that in the future, your code changes. So for example, somebody adds a new one and there's no default in this at all. There's no default to say, well, I don't know what breed this is, blah, 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 right? So the compiler... The, the JavaScript runtime in this case doesn't help you at all. There's no guardrails. You can totally write code and mess it up on purpose. Years ago, TypeScript came out with enums or enumerators. And enumerators are cool because they help you represent an or. By default, every value of an enum is different. So if I do a breed in, as an enum in TypeScript, notice the .ts, and I say enum breed, I say lab, and notice I don't set a sign of value, Behind the scenes, it's automatically assigned a value of zero or one or two for Husky, right? And so that way we can use these enums the same way. We can model it as that's an or. We can then make our type dog. And again, you can use interface dog or type dog. I just use type because of my functional programming background. But we can say it has a name of a string. It has an age of some kind of number. And then it has a breed of breed, right? So we can combine these two modeling techniques of ands and ors to model a problem, problem domain. And the cool thing is we can use these all over the places. So the types will help us guarantee that we always make name a string and age a number, but breed can only be one of those three things. And when we use it in a switch statement, you'll notice that you'll get compile errors. So let's, let's bring this code over to a TypeScript compiler and I'll show you what I mean. All right, so we have our code in the TypeScript playground. And the reason I like it here is that the TypeScript compiler will run in the background and we can see the errors. We can also see what it compiles to runtime. Which, If you are willing to make TypeScript strict and turn strict on, that is specifically around a lot of the strict null checking. If you do an enum in a switch statement, you don't have to do a default. The compiler will guarantee that you handle every possible case of that enum, which is amazing, right? thing that's not amazing is the error. Function lacks any return statement as type does not include undefined. What they're saying is that this function could possibly return a string or undefined, right? So that would make the type definition correct. The problem then is if you fix that, it says not all code, code paths return a value. And the issue is that even if you did down here, they want you to say, all right, return undefined specifically, right? Then you don't have an error. But that defeats the whole purpose. What you're trying to do is not return undefined. You want to guarantee you always return a string because you only ever have three breeds. So it guarantees that you always return a string. How do you do that? Well, you read this compile error and you mnemonically change your brain to say, oh, when they say this, what they mean is I forgot a enum. So we'll get husky. We'll say dog name. 
because Huskies love to sit on snow because they love the cold weather. So you can see the compiler errors are gone now because it knows that. So again, the compiler error is awful. It, it kind of helped a little bit, but not really. What we're really trying to do is say, you forgot to handle all your enum possibility. It didn't say that. What it said was something about the return value, and then you fix that, and it's like, well, dude, somewhere in here doesn't return again. It's like, dude. So notice, there's no default. You don't have to handle default anymore because you, TypeScript guarantees that you handle every single breed. That's amazing. And so that's what's really great about the enums from that perspective. So remember when we forgot the breed husky and we did this? We basically said, oh, it can return a string or undefined. The or is really just that. If you're familiar with ors such as like if thing or that, right, from an if statement, it's usually the two pipes. But if you do a single pipe in TypeScript, that's how you can do what's called an anonymous union or an anonymous discriminated union. But just call it a union, right? As long as it has a thing or a thing, that's a union. Now, it's not defined anywhere. You just made it up. You just said the function can return a string or undefined. And it's completely valid as long as your function actually does the return value of what it says it's going to do. So it returns a string or undefined if you pass in Husky or anything else, right? And so that correctly identifies a union type. It's a type that takes a possible set of values and guarantees only one happens. So it's going to be a string or undefined. It's not going to return both. When I say the words, the function can return both, what I really mean is it returns a single type, a single union type that is one or the other. Got it? That's what, where the discriminated part comes in. It discriminates between the two. And which is funny because TypeScript doesn't discriminate very well, which we'll talk about in a minute. So that's an anonymous type. If you want to, you could say print dog response is a string or it's an undefined. Now I can use interface, I just use type because that's you know, my functional programming background. So now you can do that. And that way you have a typed union. So it looks more like a real type, right? And like a record would be a type dog. That's a record. It's a bunch of ands and data. A type print dog response. It's an or. It's one of these two. So again, you have your types defined. It's just one's an and, one's an or. And that is a lot more readable versus this anonymous stuff everywhere. The problem is, or the pro is, TypeScript makes it so convenient to do this pipe everywhere. That, that's why a lot of people do it. So now that we understand what a union type is, it's an or, and we can define it rather than doing an anonymous, you might be thinking then, well, what, can I do that with an enum? Well, no, sadly not. The problem is enums are typically name value, and that name is a special compilation thing. So let's leave this here for a second. We're going to go into the uh, compiler, let's use our enum real quick. And what we're trying to do is guarantee that we actually use the code so TypeScript doesn't tree shake and say, oh, I don't need to put this in the, the runtime JavaScript. It's like, no, you do, we wanna see it. So if we look at the runtime JS, notice how the enum is actually an object with property values as the strings and the values are numbers. Now there's a whole plethora of information around enums and the dangers of doing this, but by default, it's a very useful behavior and very cool because this is actually compiled in JavaScript and you can reference this stuff. It's a lookup table very fast. So a lot of cool things about that. You'll notice that a print dog response is not anywhere to be found in any of this runted code, right? So it's just a type that's there for the compiler. It has nothing to do with the runtime. The second interesting thing though, is that these are actual types. They're not values, right? It's just a string or undefined. It's not like the first value is a string, the second value is an undefined, right? So for example, if you were to change this to let's say enum print dog response, and you were to say string or undefined, the compiler is gonna get really strange because like that's not assignable to like an actual enum. It's not a name value. So that's one thing that enums can't do where discriminated unions are actually the type and the name. So it, I know it sounds weird, but the, the actual value and type are the same thing. So let's elaborate on some of the, the basic union types that kind of look like enums and we'll work our way up to the data. So we're gonna delete our enum here. We're gonna make a, a type called breed and we'll do a, a normal defined discriminated union. We'll say breed and we'll say lab. Notice we're using a string here. We can do Shelty and we can do Husky. So it looks just like an enum, 
And the difference though is again, it's not actually compiled in the runtime JavaScript. Okay, we have our print function here and notice again, we only want to return a string, but we're forgetting one of the possible scenarios of this breed. So very similar to enum, it's one of these three. It can only be one at the same time. It can never be both a lab and a husky, right? And we can combine it with records, which is awesome. So we take in a dog and we check the breed. But we're only handling two scenarios. And so the compiler is like, yo, it's the same error again. So if you look at that error, what it means is you forgot a potential eventuality. So just like enums, discriminated unions can be safely used in switch statements without a default to guarantee that you handled every possible scenario. So if somebody changes the code later, then you're safe. The compiler will let you know. It helps you refactor with the compiler, not just unit test. Second, if you forget something, no big deal. Compiler's got you back. You don't ever need to do a default and go, this should never happen. That's nonsense. We're not going to do this whole throw explosions in our code at runtime because we've reached impossible situations. No, we're going to use the compiler to model to make sure that those impossible situations are impossible ever happen. Cool? So that's again why we're using unions and they look just like enums, okay? So now you're probably saying, cool, it looks kind of like an enum, but it doesn't really have a value, but it can hold types. So, okay, you can define them anonymously uh, where enums can't. You can define them with strings in line and they kind of work like enums, but they don't add to the JavaScript compile runtime size because they're not compiled in. Okay, that's another neat thing. But so far, I'm not convinced. One other advantage that unions have over enums is the concept of using them. So notice here we have breed and we just use the value right there. There's no breed.shelty, it's just the string. So if you're coming from another programming language, you might think it odd to use strings as types. If you're a Haskell developer, the, the big joke in the ML community in general is that if you see a string, your next question is, why is this untyped, <laughs> right? So it's a string. But TypeScript embraces strings because a lot of JavaScript developers, especially with CSS, we use strings all over the place. It's very, very important. They, they work both partials and a lot of different types that are advanced in TypeScript use strings and they are type safe. So they're not as dangerous as you would think coming from like Haskell or other strictly type programming languages. So this is good. This is not bad. This is a wonderful feature and very helpful and very safe. However, enums don't work like that. Enums, I have to go lab, shelty, husky. And then when I want to go down here and use it, I actually have to type it out. I have to go breed.shelty and breed.lab, right? And that sucks. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just type shelty or lab? Well, you can, because it's compiled as an object at runtime, you can destructure it. So if we destructure those values from the enum, downstairs, down here, we can do both. We can do that or that, and it works, right? So again, discriminated unions don't have that problem. You can use them as is, and they're defined right there as a type, where enums, you have to structure those things out. So kind of annoying. But that's binary. The most powerful thing to discriminated unions is that when they union a thing. So we've talked about basically names and properties as values as the same thing or types, but really they can hold data. Let's imagine a scenario where the developers of Undici, Node Fetch, and any, I guess, Axios, any HTTP library in Node.js that does a wrapper around Fetch. What if they all got together and said, there's only five possible scenarios that HTTP, which has been around forever, can possibly return? Let's enumerate those in very common errors and get rid of the whole res.response.return crap and make it same. Wouldn't it be cool if they did that? So what would that be? What would, we, what would that be if we modeled it? Well, it would be an HTTP error and we could never ever have to use a dot catch in a promise chain again or a try catch around our async await. That would all go away and we could safely use a return value. At that point, it's on us if the JSON was whack or something like that, right? What would those be? What would that look like? Well, there's only actually five if you look at it from an Elmling perspective where I stole this from. The first is a battery URL. If you type in, like, let's say, cow moo cheese, that's not a good URL. <laughs> like, the browser doesn't know what that is. There's no HTTP or HTTPS. There's no address, right? No one knows what that is. So that would be a, a, your first problem. The second would be a timeout. So we're not, we're not worried about Turing completeness here, but really just after a certain amount of time, the browser is going to give up and say, I guess the server's not there. I don't know what's going on. It took too long. If you're 
doing a local web server, you're connecting local host, and you forgot to connect. It's like, all right, dude, like for a minute, I'm not going to you know, sit there and wait forever, right? So you have some kind of timeout. It's built in to the HTTP call, so it doesn't sit there forever. Third is a network error. The network error will be something like you try to connect and you disconnected your internet or something's awry with your host file and it's trying to connect to some website, but it keeps going to local host or something weird happens around some of your networking hardware or perhaps you're on a network where they go through a firewall and they rewrite HTTPS search. All kinds of crazy stuff can happen that has nothing to do with you, your code, or the web server you're talking to. It's just the networking stuff that facilitates that message going back and forth. So that networking error is out of your control, but it's interesting because it means it's not your fault. It's not your server-side developer's fault. And it did have a response. It's just something really bad happened out of your control. So it's important, you know, not your fault, something out of your control, but you still need to handle it. Bad status, we know what this is. This would be anything in the range of a 400 through a 500. It's either a 400, you didn't authenticate for some reason, you're not authorized. 500 is the server is exploding for some reason, right? Or we get a status back that isn't really correct. Like we, we thought we sent our JSON web token, but it's not quite authenticated, something like that. That status would tell us what the status code is. And from there we can figure out, oh, if it's 400, redirect. If it's 500, wait a minute, retry, exponentially back off. There's a lot of strategies you can handle bad status. You can do something about it. Network error, you can just maybe retry and pray. The last one is bad body. Bad body would be you attempted to get some JSON and they did a response of content type XML and you're like, what? Or you want JSON, but they gave an HTTP response, which could be either Nginx, the web server, or something else sent an error page, right? Like there's a lot of reasons that you're attempting to get JSON, but the server just sent something back. So these would be the errors put as enums. And then we could have a fetch library wrap this and you would never have to worry about errors. You'd only ever have those five ever. That's amazing, right? Let's put this in a switch statement and see what it looked like. Well, the issue with bad URL is cool, but what was the URL I used? Now, if you wanted to put this in a closure or in some kind of class wrapper, then it could remember what the URL is by looking over there. But the actual response can't be very stateless, right? It has to know about what that is. There's no message in, contained in it. When you click on a mouse and you get a mouse event, the mouse event contains information of where you clicked. These don't because enums can't contain data. They can contain kind of values, right? But they can't really contain values after the fact. So for example, you could make bad URL a string, like bad URL, and then timeout would be numbers, right? But these have to be constants at runtime. And so TypeScript really gets mad if you don't have some kind of initializer. That initializer has to run once. It can't like be dynamically changed at runtime, and the data can't be anything beyond really strings and numbers. So you're very limited in the data that you can put in those enums. The same thing with, net, you know, timeout and network is not a bit bad deal, but bad status, what is the number? Well, suddenly, this is a string, but this is a number, okay? And then bad body is even harder because body, what was the body? Is it a buffer? Is it JSON? Is it text? We don't know. We have to look at the content type, see what it is, and attempt to parse it. So if it's a 500 and it's a text error, we have to parse the text, response.txt, rather than response.json, right? So a lot of this stuff just doesn't facilitate having data. You know what does? Records, objects, interfaces, types, right? Normal JavaScript objects handle that or classes, for example. And so enums don't really work for that because they can tell you what it is, but not the context or data around it. That's what discriminated unions can do. Let's show you that. The naive thing to do be like type bad URL, type bad status, that's a string, that's a number, that's a body or a buffer, for example. And I'm just gonna put object for now because it's probably an object, but in Node.js would be a buffer because we're in the browser. And then type timeout, it's a thing, I guess. And then type, Network error, network error. It's an object or something. And, and fine, but we have data. Here is the problem with that. There's no information to designate this object from this object. And what I mean by that is that these are types. Remember how enums actually compile to a thing in the JavaScript? They actually compile. There's no like stuff compiled in here. There's no, there's no types or anything compiled. It's just like gone. This is just for the compiler. Enums actually were an object, so you could play with them. Because of that, TypeScript can't differentiate between these types unless you give it some kind of common theme between these objects. If you're from an object-oriented programming, this might make more sense. 
you have a class bad URL and it just has the string URL in it. So you go new bad URL, put the URL in there. That's the error, right? Bad status. The reason that's important is that at runtime, you can differentiate between what the class type is using instance of. And that's because this class has a prototype property and it can walk up the prototype chain looking at the proto. These are built into class objects. It's all kinds of infrastructure built in. So when you go new bad URL or new bad status, it has enough metadata to detect the two using this instance of, right? That's how it works. That doesn't work for types because they don't exist. <laughs> They're only for the compiler. They're not at runtime. The other problem with this is this is runtime. So you don't find out you screwed up until after the fact. For example, what is this, right? You can't do the, the classes aren't going to help you here. They're going to, the compiler is going to let you write bad code or impossible situations and ship it. Whereas types aren't going to let you do that. Discriminator unions are going, I'm not compiling until this is right. I usually use type or kind, but we're going to use the word error type to indicate what kind of error type thing this is. So bad URL is an error type of bad URL. You can put whatever you want here as long as it's the same type. So you could put a number or whatever. I just put a string so it's easier to, to read at runtime. And you get code hints in VS Code and other you know editors like IntelliJ and WebStorm, for example. Notice bad body. We can still use other unions in it because, again, it might come back as a string if it's 500. Otherwise, it's hopefully going to come back as a buffer, right, as JSON, and we can parse it. But it could be JSON, a buffer. <laughs> Who knows? It could be a bunch of things. So that's why we have a union type of both. So it's cool. It's anonymous within a non-anonymous union type. Timeout error is pretty straightforward. It just has an error type of timeout error. But notice that because there's no properties, like there, it, there's no way to differentiate between typeout, timeout error, and um, network error. Because again, they were this. They had no the data in them, they're just blank objects. So they look effectively the same, but now they're not the same because it literally says network error. And if, let me learn how to spell here. And so now they're two different things. Yes, they have the air type property. All of them have an air type, but the value is different. This allows the TypeScript compiler to differentiate between. So when you're doing it in a switch statement, TypeScript, when it's compiling, can look at that and go, got it. You handled all scenarios and I know the difference between them. So now that you define the type, you've got all the types defined and they have a common type differentiator or a property so the types of compiler can tell the difference between them, right? Now you bring them together. You unify them into a union or discriminated union, right? That's actually timeout. Let's see if there's a timeout error. There we go. So if you come from a functional programming language, this might look like a lot of work because in most functional programming languages, you just do this and you're done. But in TypeScript, you have to define the type, whether it's an interface, a class, or something else, first with a common denominator property. Then you unify them, right? So it's two steps. And that's okay. They, they accomplish the same thing. It's just a little bit more work because TypeScript needs that type information, okay? But again, it's more flexible because you can use interfaces, classes. It doesn't have to be just types. Cool? Let's say we're handling this inside of a case statement. And we're, we're looking through our switch, switch statement and saying, all right, if we have an error message, let's convert it to a string. And we got to check on the error type. So TypeScript knows that all HTTP errors have the exact same error type as a string. And so it can differentiate. So you see that code hint, how it differentiates the bad URL or the bad status. It looks like a anonymous union, but it's not. It's not anonymous. We define them up top. So bad URL, bad status, bad timeout. And again, that string is type checked. So remember when I said type using strings? As types isn't really safe in ML languages. Well, in TypeScript, it is. TypeScript helps you. So it's not timeout, it's timeout error, right? So not only is the case statement typed, but also the return types are typed. But this is the key here. Notice the bad URL has the URL. And we can access that URL because if we looked up here, we included that URL property as part of that type or that, that interface or that class or that object, whatever you want to call this thing, right? The key, though, is it's safe to access in this code path. If we try to do the same thing here for the timeout, which has no URL, oh, look at that. It doesn't exist on type of timeout, right? Pretty cool. So even though it's an HTTP error, it knows the difference because you checked the type first. So this is where we talk about data access. Same for code. We can do code here, but not elsewhere because we know it's safe to do here because it's of type bad status, which has the error code. Same for bad body, it has the body. And so this is, this is the amazing thing about the union types over enums is that they can 
hold that data, hold that information, and then you can safely extract it using dots. So if you've read my book on functional programming, you know that dots and JavaScript are the most insanely unsafe thing you can do. They had no coalescing, which or allows you to do things like this. So you can say, well, if it's null, don't worry about it. It's like, no, no. We're strict. We have strict on in the power. We want to guarantee our code works. We're using TypeScript to guarantee we can get rid of all that nonsense, all this null pointer nonsense. Well, cool. Use unit types and you can. <laughs> so you can unify all these disparate data types into a single value and then safely extract them and it make sure you handle all cases and spell it correctly. See what I'm saying? This thing is awesome. Discriminated unions are where it's at, man. All right, I've talked about UI development before, but let's talk about it from a TypeScript perspective. When you are doing UI development, you'll often have things like is loading is true and something like Redux or using NGX store or some kind of context in React or using reducers or if you're an Angular, having some kind of behavior subject that has a state of a UI process. And so you're going to model that. So you're either loading you have some data, it's either undefined if you haven't loaded it yet, or it's gonna be some data type once it loads, and you gotta to, to designate, is this an error message or not? And so this single object, this and, is loading and data, and is error, and error. So if is error is true, then you're gonna look for that error property to have some information about wrong, right? If it's not, cool, you're either loading or not. If you're loading, cool, don't worry about it. If you're not loading and is error is false, you got some data and you can show your eye. If we successfully loaded it, loading's false, error's false, and here's our data. It's an array of strings and we can use our UI to draw successfully, right? And we can also handle the error scenario. And if his loading is true, we show a loading dialog. The issue though is you can't guarantee unless you handle all kinds of scenarios on what happens when you get in a possible state. So for example, we have his loading false and we have our data, but his error is also true and we have an error. How did this happen? Well, if you look at some of the reducers I've written about in previous blog articles, you can get in a situation where you're destructuring data, you're following good immutable data practices, and you accidentally reuse the same object and don't reset its state. And so now it's in both a success and failure state. What does this mean? How do you draw this? Sometimes you get lucky, your code's imperative and checks the loading first and the happy path first. So it would draw this. Other times, it could be a legitimate error, and it's showing the data to the users that's stale, and they're like, dude, why is it not working? It's actually hiding the error. Also a horrible problem. So these kind of states are really frustrating. They're impossible, yet they can happen easily because of exponential growth of properties. Every data type that we add to this record exponentially handles the possibilities that could possibly be in, and the code used to create it has to be really, really type like like unit tested well to make sure we don't end up in this state. So if you're interested, I wrote this blog post that talks about it, easier async, but you're gonna see a loading state, an error state or success state. The issue is when you get an impossible state from this reducer and it basically draws the wrong thing because it's, why is it stopping here for success? Because it's, it's an error, right? <laughs> it even has the data. The common problem in React, common problem in Angular, common problem in Vue, doesn't matter the framework. It's just, you know, you have an impossible situation that shows those screens. There's actually another problem too. Here's what Twitter, and Chris Jenkins talks about this. He, he built a library to help solve this problem. There's a lot of UIs that use loading as kind of like a, the default state. So they're in a loading state, but they don't even draw it. They just draw the happy path and they're waiting for the data to load. So for example, his tweet has no retweets or likes. That's actually not true. It's, it's showing zero because it probably had undefined. And it's like, oh, I guess it's zero. When the data loads, it actually has a number then draws it designers inability to handle the fact that the ui can exist in those three possible states of loading gets the data or loading failed to load the data sometimes the designer doesn't know sometimes the developer doesn't effectively communicate to the visual designer it just happens the same thing with slack like when you when you first load it really quick especially if you're a large company and you have a lot of information it'll say you don't have any direct messages which is completely untrue because i have like sixty thousand. like that's completely untrue slack also has that problem the other issue too is that there's no waiting Sometimes you're not always loading. Sometimes the Ajax call hasn't run. You'll see a lot of people on the internet that say that is loading always defaults to true. And that's because it's assumed that when you show a component like that, it's automatically gonna do the Ajax call. That's also not true because sometimes the user needs to initiate it. So there's actually four. It's waiting, is loading, success or failure, right? Those are the four, four types we're looking at from a union perspective. And waiting is really important because sometimes you can retry, sometimes the user needs to give you information before you can load. 
And so we're gonna we're gonna model that using union types. To get rid of that bug, we're gonna put a state, right, of the commonality property. You can see it's highlighted here on all four. So we have a waiting state, a loading state. Now failure, when it happens, we wanna know what the error is. So we keep that that data encapsulated with that particular state. Same thing with success. If we get data, we wanna draw a list of strings that come back from that success. So we put that in there as well as the data. We then do step two and unify those union types to discriminate between <laughs> which one it is. Cause we want a UI development, you only draw like four screens. So union types or ORs are perfect for it because we only draw a limited number of screens and we only wanna show the user a limited number of possibilities. And so union types go great with that because we only ever wanna show waiting, loading, failure, success. Now again, waiting might be very controversial if you've been doing UI development forever. Let me give you a scenario. The screen shows loading and the server's up, your code's good, you think, but you don't, it doesn't come back. You open up the network panel, there's no Ajax. So that's problem number one. The other problem is you open up the network panel and there's 50 Ajax calls. <laughs> so like, is it loading or is one of those yours? Which one? Like, can I filter the URL maybe? Is it like all the same URL? And so waiting is a very important thing because sometimes you forgot to initiate the Ajax call. And so this is a little help, helping hand to guarantee that you went to the state you think you did. So waiting actually helps in that scenario. Okay, so we have waiting, loading, failure, and type remote data. Let's look at that from a React perspective where you draw it. In the past, you would just do a feuds view, you take some props, you do your thunk, and you would just do some imperative if, 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 and draw and stop, right? And you would just inject all your data. But you don't need to do that anymore because you, you, you don't have these kind of problems of not handling the states because you want it deterministic. You want to guarantee that you handle all states. Well, if you only have four possible states, then you can do a switch statement and guarantee that you always draw one. Let's delete that code. I'm going to rename, rename what I paste, by the way. So let's do const foods view equals, there we go. And now what we have is a React component that takes our remote data and can safely case through those four states and guarantee to only draw that state in that particular place, right? But because it's a discriminated union, you can safely access the data. So for example, the failure state, you can get the props error message. For the success, you can get the data, right? And you can do that safely with the compiler to help you. And you only do it in that state. So this can't accidentally access data it's not supposed to. This can't access error message data because the compiler will guarantee that if you're in that state, you'll handle it. And it's not just valuable for back-end development, it's also valuable for front-end development where we're really, really concerned about only showing the user certain things at certain times. And ORs, discriminated unions, are amazing. All right, I'm gonna bring up the table here of some of the pros. So we talked about some of the pros and cons. I just wanted to put them all together so you can see all the things we talked about and the pros and cons of each. Enums are cool because they're a single native word. You can do single native words in TypeScript without doing the quotes, the single quotes or the double quotes as a discriminated union, but then you have to define it as a type, then reference it. It's stupid. Enums, you just go the word and it's blue and you can use it and it's really nice. Enums also have exhaustive checking. If you turn on strict in TypeScript, it'll guarantee you handle every possible scenario of the enums. That's fantastic. The cons though is there's no data associated with that. So if you want a record with all kinds of other data or even just a number that's differentiated from a string down here, you can't do that. You also have to destructure the values if you want to use those single word values. So although you can say the word lab, you then later have to go breed.lab. You can't just say lab, right? Unless you just structure it first up, up top somewhere. Very frustrating. Unions do both strings and data. So you get the flexibility of doing both and you can choose to do both in the same union if you wanted to. Just like enums, they have exhaustion checking, but they have data associated with it. You can use these unions without defining them. So I don't think that's good, but you can do it. The way it place it is good is in the case of HTTP errors, we want to say optionally, you know, it's a, let's say it's an error or it's a string, right? Because I don't know, it could be one or the other, but it's still type safed, but do you really want to go failure error type? You could, right? Maybe that's a good practice, it's possible. And you don't have to destructure the names, that's what's important. I can use those, those, those types down, down below, the failure and using them, and it's just good to go, right? Waiting, loading. It's good, good stuff. Now unions, they, they, they don't have a single native word. So typing that is kind of frustrating where when, like for example, you, you have to use quotes and it's just a thing you have to get used to in TypeScript that strings are the norm. Even if you're an old school programmer, the concept of using raw strings or numbers 
we call them magic numbers or magic strings. But in TypeScript, magic numbers and magic strings are actually typed and they, they sometimes have meaning and the compiler will help you. So that's kind of an old school, you know, good habit that's no longer a good habit because TypeScript actually helps make it a good thing. Also, objects require a common property. So if you're coming from a functional programming language that has union types built in, they call them variants, they call them discriminated unions, they call them tags. You have to do the, the two steps in TypeScript. So that's a very frustrating thing is that we're used to just doing this and calling it a day, but TypeScript needs some kind of common property so it can tell the difference because it's not actually compiled at runtime. So we just call state and just make it the same name, same data type for all of them. You could use kind, type, it's a very common thing. Coming from a functional programming language, you might be saying like, this is very frustrating. And it is, if you're not familiar with it, like let's say, let's take Elm for example. If I were to do Elm, I would say type breed. And then I could just say lab. Shelty and Husky. And again, there's no magic quotes and I could just use, you know, if breed, actually there's not, but if breed equals Husky and there's no triple equals. So I can use them as native words. There's no magic strings and they're just there. And more importantly, if we're doing the HTTP error thing, we can define the timeout. Okay, it's a type, but if we have a, uh, let's say bad status, we can put an integer there and it'll give us the number. But if there's another one that has a bad body, we could put the string, like what's, what's the error? What's, the, what's the, the error message there, right? Is it something different or is it some kind of bad body you know, error message, which has either a string or something else? And then the same thing for you know, the network error, it's just a string tells you what actually happened. So again, you can differentiate with the two and then use them. And then when you case it out, you say case error, and you get that data. So the timeout, there's nothing there. And you just say timeout. But if it's a bad status, you actually get the code right there. The code, you can just structure it and say, okay, error code. And we can say string from int code. Right? And so you get that data, you can just structure it right there. And it's just a very easy way to use these types. And so this is where, when you're coming from, you look at TypeScript, you're like, okay, and define it once and use it, and I can use the words. I don't have to define this thing as a record and then give it a common property and do it. These languages were built around these data types. TypeScript added it after the fact and had to deal with the fact that you could bring in interfaces, classes, a lot of object-oriented stuff, a lot of imperative stuff. So it's actually quite impressive that TypeScript allows you to do this kind of advanced stuff you know, of unions in there and sometimes define it anonymously. It's pretty cool. So I know coming from Elm, Rescript, you might look at this stuff in TypeScript and go, oh my God, but it's still pretty amazing considering what it comes from. That is enums compared to discriminated unions in TypeScript. Hope you can see how, well, enums are great with TypeScript turned strict. You can do a lot of the same scenarios of guaranteeing that every single possible case statement is handled. Discriminated unions are better because A, they guarantee that you can associate data with it. B, you don't have to structure them. You can use them right there in line. And C, they actually have that data in there that's safely accessed. So if you case that particular type, you can then access that data safely in that thing and you can't screw it up. The compiler will let you know. So not only can you add things later after the fact, can you change data after the fact, the compiler will guarantee you handle every single one, you access it at the right time, and it's the correct data type, right, with the same URL. That's absolutely amazing. It's very flexible, very type safe, doesn't add to the file size when you compile it. Discriminated unions are where it's at. So hopefully that gets you excited to check it out in TypeScript. If you got other questions, hit me up in the comments. I'm Jester Excel on Twitter. And careful when you Google the stuff. If you type in TypeScript union, sometimes you'll get the old documentation and they'll say this page is deprecated. Go to the new stuff. You just click the new one. Then you'll get the union types and they'll walk you through the docs. So that's how it works in TypeScript.